Live from Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome, friends. Good to have you aboard our final program coming to you live from Kalamata, Greece, the elite city resort hotel here in this beautiful city. And uh, then later today, I'll be packing up the uh, car with the twin boys, nephew Nick, and of course, the mighty Aphrodite will be riding shotgun as we head on up to Athens, where we'll be for about three days. Then finally, the final leg home uh, to Toronto uh, later in the week. Loving it here, but quite honestly, can't wait to get home, of course, to Toronto the good. Thanks once again for inviting me into your home, into your uh, living room, your bedroom, or whatever the case may be. Bedroom. Yikes. Hey, it's a family show, folks, but not to worry. You know, I'm a, I'm a Canadian boy, so I always take off my shoes when entering a home. And that's a, a kind of a cultural difference, I found. Uh, when we were uh, out and about here in Greece and we go into someone's home, and I, it's just habit, I, take my, I kick my sandals off. And people say, oh, what are you doing that for? You know, what's that? That's just the way we are. We're Canadian. We buy our milk in bags and we remove our shoes upon entering a home. What can I tell you? Hey, uh, excited. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I should have an announcement about a new affiliate for the Conspiracy Show in Oregon, which will be our first station there. So fingers crossed, in a couple of weeks, we'll have that announcement. Medford, Oregon, I believe, is the market. So the hits just keep on coming. Uh, hey, a special thanks to Chris Whitting at uh, Syndication Networks. He and his staff doing a great job uh, landing new uh, radio stations for the conspiracy show. We're going to talk solar storms. You've probably heard the buzz. A lot of NASA scientists are uh, quite concerned. We are in the sort of the peak uh, time now for solar storms. Of course, the sun goes through these 11-year cycles. And I believe we are now in the 11th year of that 11-year cycle. And this is when the poles, the north and south poles of the sun, yes, the sun has a north and south pole, and they attract, uh, and they flip. And the north pole, apparently, of the sun has already flipped. The south pole is racing to catch up. And this causes these, these coronal ejections. But NASA scientists and others are very concerned that we are about to witness a mass ejection, a coronal mass ejection that could rival the Carrington event, which took place back in the mid-1850s and knocked uh, uh, telegraphs offline and uh, uh, caused a great deal of havoc with the, uh, the, the railroads and so forth. Imagine, though, if that were to happen in 2013 and we're expecting some sort of solar flare, solar storm impact, given our dependency, of course, on electronics, satellite, computers, sophisticated communication systems, and, of course, our fast electrical grids, we're being warned that these solar storms could wreak havoc, particularly with the electrical grids. In fact, even Lloyds of London weighed in recently, and we're, uh, we're, we're sort of weighing the, the uh, insurance implications, particularly in North America. If a solar flare impacts the planet and the resulting electromagnetic pulse could knock these power grids offline, and I'm not talking for a couple of days, they're saying this could have an impact for one or two years in certain communities. And again, the, the corridor they're looking at is New York down to Washington, D.C., about 40 million people. And it could impact elsewhere as well. But this is a frightening scenario. Imagine a power grid being knocked offline for several years, large metropolitan areas, 40 million people left to freeze in the dark. Imagine the, the civil unrest that this could cause, the interruption in the delivery of fuel and groceries, and you get the picture. Apparently, we just narrowly avoided such an impact in late July, and now, again, NASA scientists and others are saying there could be another one within the next four months. So 
So we thought we'd uh, fly this one up the flagpole for the next hour or so because it's that important. And uh, to help us along in this conversation, Ron Patton, publisher of Paranoia Magazine. He became the publisher in 2012. In fact, he revived the publication from dormancy. He's a conspiracy researcher and writer, having written articles for Paranoia, Paranoia Magazine on CIA mind control. Also, he's written about the historical and spiritual implications of the UFO alien phenomenon. He's published a newsletter from 1994 to 2000 called Endure to the End, which exposed tangent movements and erroneous doctrines within contemporary Christianity. And uh, he's also published a magazine in 2003 titled MK Zine, an examination of coercive mind control, evasive human experimentation, and other related abuses. In 2005, Ron was featured in a controversial film documentary titled Triple Expose, which uh, talked about the horrific incidents of abuse and torture of women in, B- in the BDM- BDSM uh, porn cult. He's provided vital information in showing how the leader was going or using coercive mind control techniques similar to those used in the CIA's MK Ultra behavioral modification program from the 1950s to the 1970s. Uh, but as I say, he is now um, at the helm of Paranoia Magazine, and it's always a pleasure to have Ron Patton here on The Conspiracy Show. Ron, how are you? Doing quite well. Thank you for having me on, Richard. Uh, Listen, before we get into uh, this uh, solar storm and EMP impact, uh, let's just talk a little bit about uh, the current, uh, the summer issue of Paranoia Magazine. What's going on, uh, what do you have in in store uh, this summer in Paranoia? Well, it's uh, doing quite well, actually. It it seems as if each issue gets better and better, and we get a lot of good uh, reviews which is great for subscriptions. Unfortunately, my, my distribution um, is a little down because the distributor I was using just unfortunately isn't working out. So I'm just pretty much relying on subscriptions now, and people can go to paranoiamagazine.com to subscribe. But in this summer issue, we have uh, some very intriguing articles, um, one called The Return of the Phoenix, The Four Sons of an Intruder Planet, by Jason M. Breschers. Um, and then we have Adam Go Rightly, who is a very prolific writer for Paranoia, and I think you know him quite well. And he Adam's wrote good friend, uh, great guy. a very interesting article called uh, The Dead Comedian Conspiracy. And so he kind of really gets into, you know, looking at some of the premature demises and suspicious circumstances of some of the deaths of uh, various comedians um, like um, Lenny Bruce and uh, Freddie Prinze, just to name a few. And um, then we also have uh, an article called A History of Silence, and it's a very um, chilling, riveting article about child trafficking in the United States. And it was written by a uh, MK Ultra survivor by the name of David Scherter from Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, other articles, uh, the DOD's Paranormal Files on Transhumanism and Human Singularity by H. Michael Sweeney. And Victor Thorne wrote an article. Um, it's fantastic. He did an excellent job in, in doing a lot of very detailed research and it's called uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. Wag the dog meets a strategy of tension. That's that's quite a uh, an issue. That's jam packed, my friend. Listen, we'll uh, we'll preview the fall uh, issue of Paranoia Magazine in just a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to get on now to, of course, the uh, the topic du jour, which a uh, great deal of buzz, uh, and understandably so, about the possibility of a solar storm headed our way. Uh, we are in this peak. Uh, of this 11-year cycle with the sun, and, and scientists are very concerned about a coronal mass ejection that could rival the Carrington event, as I said, of the 1850s. What are you, what are you hearing about this? Well, I mean, I, you know, before you told me about what you'd like to discuss on the show, I, I did a little bit of research, and I looked at some information from NASA and uh, 
you know, some other websites. And it appears that uh, we're going to have some sort of event. We're, we're definitely overdue for it. Um, from my understanding, these uh, significant solar storms occur about every 100 years. And the, the last uh, really big one was in 1859, like you had mentioned earlier, the, the Carrington effect. Um, so if this does occur, then, of course, it's going to have a devastating impact upon the uh, infrastructure, you know, knocking out power plants and transformers, cell towers, I mean, even satellites. So, yeah, it's uh, a pretty scary possibility indeed. I mean, let's uh, speculate a little, uh, a little bit here, not to raise... Uh alarms. Well, we need to raise alarms. I mean, this is a real possibility, but I mean, not to frighten unnecessarily, but, you know, as the old saying goes, uh, forewarned, forearmed. What do you think, uh, you know, would be going on in major metropolitan areas if all of a sudden, you know, the lights went out for an extended period of time? Right. Well, before I, I get into that, I just wanted to mention a book. Um, it's, uh, a fiction by William Fortune, I believe is his name, and it's called One Second After. It was written in 2009. Again, although the book's a, a fiction, it, it's based on reality in the sense that he put together um, sort of a catastrophe model, which was actually created by U.S. government agencies. And so the premise of the book has to do what if there was... Um, an EMP or electromagnetic pulse. And in his book, he talks about uh, a nuclear explosion high in the atmosphere, which created this uh, EMP. And that's it, another way of that's another way of creating an EMP other, other than a solar storm. Listen, Ron, uh, sorry to jump in. Got to take a time out. We'll come back. The music is percolating up. When we return, we'll get into solar storms. Ron Patton from Paranoia Magazine. As the conspiracy show comes to you live from the Elite City Resort in Kalamata, Greece. Question everything. This is the conspiracy show with Richard Serrett. Welcome back. Ron Patton is with us from Paranoia Magazine as we broadcast live from the Elite City Resort Hotel in Kalamata, Greece. We're talking about an impending solar storm which could unleash a massive electromagnetic pulse. Now, Ron, before the break, you were mentioning that back in, I think it was 2009, William Fortune, uh, Forstchen, rather, wrote a New York Times best-selling uh, book called One Second After, uh, which uh, dealt with this very subject, although in this case, the EMP, uh, I believe, was uh, the result of uh, a nuclear blast as opposed to a solar storm, was it not? Yes, that's correct, but essentially the effect would be the same in terms of, you know, knocking out the, uh, the electrical infrastructure. And, uh, I mean, this is something that, that I've heard people in the National Security Agency and others, uh, the Pentagon, commenting on as well. The, the risk of, uh, of an EMP attack from some rogue uh, state or rogue terror group that got their hands on a nuke, whether or not they, they had sufficient, uh, you know, uh, in other words, they wouldn't need a long-range ballistic missile to deliver it to the shores of the United States. They'd simply have to, uh, I guess, Detonated somewhere over the uh, over the continental United States, and it would unleash again this unimaginable uh, uh, event in which you know again lights would go out, uh, uh, power grids offline, communications would cease. Uh, you'd have planes falling out of the sky because of you know satellite communication and navigation systems would go down. So again, let's let's imagine that this solar storm happens and, and a coronal mass ejection causes an EMP. What's it going to be like in places like New York City, Washington, D.C.? Paint me a picture. Well, you know, again, getting back to the book, he talks about what's referred to as die-off sequences. And again, this is all based on actual projections by... Uh, the Department of Defense and other government agencies. And so let's say the first word or the first week you have uh, 
an onset of disease, you know, due to tainted food and polluted drinking water. And you have a certain uh, percentage of people getting sick, some of the elderly uh, that start dying. And then in 30 days, you have, let's say, people that are cardiac patients or people that are uh, drug dependent, uh, diabetics, they start dying off. And then, of course, uh, as time progresses, it just sort of uh, it's becomes exponential. And the projection within the book was a 90% die-off rate, primarily in uh, major metropolitan areas. Now, places like in the Midwest, where there is um, a little bit more sustainable um, climate for growing food, um, that was only about 50%. But it just seems like you're doomed for the most part if you reside in a, in a major metropolitan area, and if this indeed does occur, um, it's a scary um, possibility indeed. And uh, then you have to think about how does one really prepare for this if you do live in the city? Um, so I think that's really a, an important question to ask. Any plans uh, to, to cover this in an upcoming uh, issue of Paranoia? Um, now that I'm looking, delving into it a little bit more, I think uh, we should. Um, I'm also going to do probably an article uh, about the Fukushima fallout. A lot of people have uh, forgotten about that. And, that's right. uh, but that's still affecting us uh, quite profoundly. And there's so much cover-up regarding the uh, radiation exposure that's occurring all over the planet. I, I, uh, well, just to... to uh diverge slightly here from a moment on Fukushima. I, I happened to see a press conference online with a spokesperson at the plant and uh, was quite candid and said, you know, we cannot contain this. The situation is dire. And basically threw his hands up at this point said, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> right. And, you know, the interesting thing is um, there's a lot of people that have uh, Geiger counters um, you know, internationally, they're they're sort of uh, monitoring and, and testing for radiation levels, and uh, it just seems to get higher and higher in, in uh, different remote places. So, um, the guy is correct who you know said that at the press conference because it's still affecting us in a very detrimental and profound way. Uh, back to solar storms, and just a reminder, Ron Patton, publisher of Paranoia Magazine, joining us here on The Conspiracy Show. You mentioned this, this die-off sequence, which is quite uh, morose, obviously, to even contemplate. Uh, but one could imagine that if the United States, uh, for example, was left that vulnerable after such an attack... Uh, you, you know, nu nuclear nuclear missile silos. I'm, I'm I'm guessing would also go down. They'd be offline. Uh, they'd be wide open to an attack. So anyone who's left would be ripe for total invasion. I would think. Um, yeah, it would appear that way. Um, and I really don't know if there are any have been any type of contingency plans for something like that. But my gut feeling is that um, there are probably some underground facilities that um, are able to sort of uh, survive, you know, um, this type of uh, EMP attack. Um, but for how long, you know, that's the thing, because apparently this, uh, this could be for not just a few days or a few weeks, but the uh, devastating consequences could last for several months to several years. What are you hearing uh, in terms of? Uh, well, well, let me let me put it this way: we we hear about you know these secret uh, FEMA camps and and plans to instigate or, or to implement rather uh, uh, martial law. And people are wondering, well, what are they preparing for? We had reports FEMA buying up um, tons of ammunition and uh, 
Uh, there were also reports of uh, various U.S. government agencies stockpiling uh, caskets, uh, which led people to wonder, again, what are they preparing for? Is this the event, do you think, Ron, that they might be preparing for, this massive coronal ejection? Honestly, I don't know. <laughs> but it would appear to be, you know, something that's, scientifically based. I don't think there's much debate over whether or not it's going to happen. Um, it's just a matter of when and, you know, how devastating is it going to be? Um, you know, some people are making the assumption that the, uh, the electromagnetic pulse will do us in. No, that doesn't, that's not going to affect us. What's really going to be devastating is, again, the decline of the infrastructure, especially in uh, some of the bigger cities. And, um, you know, it's going to be sort of like a domino effect or a cascade of failures, so to speak, where one thing's going to affect the other and um, there's going to be looting and rioting and, you know, there's just going to be total chaos. And so to see it would be really hard for me to sort of fathom how martial law would really come into play with this amount of devastation. I just, I can't really, I can't wrap my head around it because it would be so ominous, I guess. Um, if there were other events that occurred with uh, less amount of uh, devastation, then I, then I can see how martial law would be implemented. But, uh, boy, something like this, it's, it's crazy. And, again, you got to look at it not just from, you know, North America, but how is this going to affect the rest of the planet? So I guess that's, that's true. We, we tend to focus on North America. And, and the Lloyds of London article I mentioned off the top, again, they were focusing on uh, the United States. My understanding is that uh, Great Britain and other jurisdictions, I'm not sure which other jurisdictions, but have taken certain measures to shield their electronics, their power grids from such an event, but I guess in this case, the United States is lagging behind in that regard. They haven't taken the necessary precautions. Hmm. Yeah, and of course, uh, that's just going to melt down, of course, the, the fiber optics or anything that's sort of vulnerable to this type of uh, electromagnetic pulse. But... Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see what transpires. Apparently, um, these storms are could last until about 2020, from what I've read. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, I, I don't have a handle on the uh, the date. I just my understanding is that we are sort of in the peak of this solar cycle, in which we get a lot of this tumultuous activity. Um, right. but the, the interesting thing is, you know, we, we talked about the Carrington event, which took place, as you say, in 1859. That was the largest solar yep. storm on record. But it, it went, I won't say largely unnoticed, but the impact wasn't felt because, again, we're talking 1859 before the advent of power grids and, and uh, electronics and computers. But even then, uh, telegraph reporters were reporting that sparks were coming off their devices. And um, the other interesting thing is the effect that this has on the northern lights. It intensifies the northern and southern lights, this electromagnetic activity. And the northern lights were so bright uh, that people were reporting they were able to read their newspaper in the dark because of the northern lights. The point here is, you know, imagine if we get something that large, a, a solar storm that large in 2013, again, given our dependency on the electrical, uh, electrical grids and, and uh, electronics and so forth, how devastating this could be. Do you, do you personally uh, have sort of a survival plan? <laughs> well, after going through some of this uh, on the Internet, doing some research today, I, that really came to mind. Um, and... I think it's uh, something that might be feasible for some people, but I think in general, just because there's so much lethargy and apathy and maybe even fear, that uh, I don't think most people would be um, really serious about putting together a, a 
you know, viable contingency plan, but I think I'm going to definitely look more into it now. I know there's several people that put together like, you know, 72 hour survival kits, but like something like this, I mean, you have to take, uh, definitely immediate action. And, you know, I'm not really sure about how much warning we have too when these solar flares actually occur and, you know, to the degree of if they're really going to create a significant electromagnetic pulse. Um, have you heard anything about that in terms of the, the warning time that's given? Well, we, I guess we, we are being warned now, but, um, you know, we, we don't really hear about how close, you know, the, the impact was until after the event. Uh, for example, the, the last one that we were being told about that occurred at the end of July, I believe it was July 30th, I think it was a couple of days later when we were when we were told, well, that was close. <laughs> so obviously, we we don't know, uh, you know, with any certainty when it's going to hit. It seems to be always right. after the fact that we're told how close it was. But we are being warned now. We're in again. We're in the peak of this solar cycle, this eleven-year solar cycle. So this is our warning, I guess. Right, and you know, one, one can hypothesize, you know, quite a bit regarding this, but uh, I guess my question, too, would be, um, you know, what about uh, vehicles, you know, your, your conventional motor vehicle? Now, is that going to be impacted? What, is the carburetor going to be fried, you know, from this electromagnetic uh, pulse? Um, so if you were wanting to get out, you know, let's say up to the hills or, or somewhere more rural, would you even be able to drive? Well, I, I was just looking at a, a quick summary of uh, William Fortschen's uh, book that you mentioned, A Second After, and there is a there is a section in there talking about all of these uh, uh, cars, you know, trying to make this desperate escape, and right. they just come to a complete stop because, you know, most cars have uh, today have major electro- electronic components fuel injection right. and all this are, are electronically uh, controlled. So I don't think there's any escape uh, if you're in a vehicle when the EMP strikes, you're going to be coming to a complete standstill. It'll be it'll be traffic grid like we've never experienced before. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you look at all the, the different possibilities and, uh, you know, scenarios and it, it just seems like it's so overwhelming. But I guess, uh, you know, you do what you can do and maybe try to create some sort of uh, semblance of uh, community and harmony within the area that you live and to, you know, be able to to prepare just the best you can. Uh, The Conspiracy Show, coming to you live from the Elite City Resort Hotel in Kalamata, Greece, back with more in a moment. Big Brother is listening, and so are you. To the Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Live from the Elite City Resort Hotel in Kalamata, Greece, the Conspiracy Show. Ron Patton, publisher of Paranoia Magazine, joins us, and uh, Tim Spreen back in studio, my technical producer. Thanks for rolling those uh, phone numbers. Would love to take some calls, ask people how serious they're taking this threat that uh, we could be facing an impending massive solar storm that could lock, knock rather, uh, power grids offline. Uh, across North America primarily. Other countries, as I say, Great Britain, apparently have taken uh, some precautions. They've uh, shielded their their power grids, their electronic systems. Uh, I'm sure certain uh, organizations in the United States, Canada, have, have taken measures as well. But by and large, the major power grid systems that deliver electricity to hospitals and homes and factories and uh, so forth across North America are vulnerable to such a solar storm and the ensuing electromagnetic pulse, which I guess would, prime, would uh, essentially fry the, uh, fry the wires. Uh, and again, this disruption in, in power would not just be for 72 hours or a couple of weeks. I've, I've read articles in which NASA scientists have been quoted as saying these power grids could be offline for one to two years before they're uh, repaired and back online. Imagine the mayhem, the havoc 
that would ensue if we were left alone in the dark for one or two years. My word. Ron Patton is uh, uh, with us, and we're speculating on uh, you know what might happen, what might occur. It's a dire scenario, uh, to be sure. Ron, do you um, do you believe? I, I asked you this before, but I just wanted to delve into this a little bit more. Do you believe that the United States government, for example, uh, is aware of this? I mean, obviously they're aware of it, but they're they're more concerned that they're letting on and. They're not necessarily giving us all the information uh, that we need. They don't obviously want to cause panic. It seems like uh, the United States has a history of doing that, and, and in so doing so, they also create a certain amount of fear. Um, but at the same time, again, looking at some of the uh, scientific evidence, it, it appears that this is something that may actually take place. Um, and, of course, yeah, they could be withholding a certain amount of information because they don't want to create uh, a lot of panic. And, uh, um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens within the next uh, several months. I'm, yeah, um, it, it, it seems to be just a matter of, uh, a matter of time. Uh, I was saying that we have uh, narrowly avoided one such EMP catastrophe about uh, two weeks ago. Here's a quote from Henry Cooper, who led strategic arms negotiations with the Soviet Union under President Reagan, and who now heads High Frontier, a group pushing for missile defense. There had been a a near miss about two weeks ago. A Carrington-class mass ejection crossed the orbit of the Earth and basically just missed us. The world escaped an EMP catastrophe. Um... Basically, this is a Russian roulette thing, said uh, Peter Vincent Pry, who served on the Congressional EMP Threat Commission from 2001 to 2008. He was referring to the 1859 EMP named after astronomer Richard Carrington that melted telegraph lines in Europe and North America. A Russian roulette thing. Uh, and as I say, they've, they've, they actually had a EMP Threat Commission from 2001 to 2008, that shows you they're taking this very seriously. And um, apparently, we just avoided a catastrophe two weeks ago. So, yeah, let's see what's in store for the next uh, over the next three or four months, which I guess is sort of the next window that these scientists are, are, are looking for. But it's interesting, you know, you don't see, you don't hear a lot of this in the news. It's it's as if the major news outlets are sort of in lockstep with the um, with the powers that be, they don't want to they don't want to cause panic, so they're just not talking about it. Right. It, it's uh, curiously suspicious as to why they're not really um, putting out a lot of information. And of course, most of this information you're finding on the uh, the internet or through uh, alternative media. And um, so, yeah, we'll just we'll have to see. Um, you know, and it, just, it amazes me, though, when you look at the history of this planet and how we've survived so much, and it, it just seems like we've been able to weather asteroids and, uh, you know, other planets bombarding into us. So hopefully there's a, there's a uh, universal force that's has a hedge of protection over us because to me that's the only thing that can really um, be able to protect us Uh, I'm always I'm really amazed that you know the earth hasn't been significantly destroyed or devastated by now I'm wondering you know thinking back of course to um, all of the uh, talk about the Mayan calendar in 2012 and whether this is what the Mayans were, were prophesizing, the, uh, a major catastrophic event that wouldn't necessarily destroy the planet, uh, but would certainly you know, push the reset button. Maybe we can touch on that when we come back uh, on the other side. Ron Patton is with us from Paranoia Magazine. We're discussing solar storms. We'll take your calls as well. Are you taking this threat seriously? If so, what precautions are you taking? Uh, The Conspiracy Show, coming to you live from the Elite City Resort Hotel in Kalamata, Greece. Back with more in a moment. Fighting the 
evidence and letting you draw your own conclusions. This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome back. Our final show from the Elite City Resort Hotel in Kalamata, Greece. Heading up to Athens later today and uh, departing for Toronto later in the week. Ron Patton stays with us, a publisher of Paranoia Magazine. We'll get a uh, preview of the upcoming fall issue and uh, let you know again how you can subscribe to Paranoia Magazine, a terrific publication and covers such a wide um, uh, scope of, of topics. And uh, right now we're talking about the um, possibility of an impending solar storm, a massive solar storm. Just to give you an indication, back in 1989, there was a, um, a rather substantial coronal ejection, and it knocked out Quebec's electrical trans, uh, transmission system, uh, Quebec, Canada. Uh, I'm not sure how long that was off. I don't recall at the time, but um, you know it was province-wide. I certainly remember that. And again, when we're talking solar storms, we're talking about electromagnetic pulses. And North Korea is reportedly testing a device to attack the U.S. with just such a device, an EMP attack. All right, um, Ron, I was mentioning uh, 2012, uh, and whether or not that prophecy had anything to do with the possibility of some sort of a coronal mass ejection, because I've heard people like theoretical physicist Michio Kaku speculating that such an EMP attack could knock civilization back 150 years. Right. So you're you're referring to the Mayan calendar, and uh, from my understanding, the end of that calendar was supposed to be what in December of 2012. However, they said the uh, a lot of the real devastating, uh, if there were to be any sort of devastation upon the planet, that would be in 2013. So it seems as if that that might in fact kind of fall into that that scope or into that uh, prediction within the Mayan calendar. So, you know, we'll see. Again, this is all speculative, but uh, um, there have been a lot of uh, very interesting insights through different sources, and uh, yeah, we'll see. All right, let's uh, say hello to Mark, joining us on the line from Alberta, Wild Rose Country. Hello, Mark. Welcome to The Conspiracy hey, Show. Hey, Richard uh, Tikani. How are you? Wonderful. Kala, kala. Excellent. Um, well, I'm, I've done a lot of research uh, uh, regarding the CME and the, uh, the coronal mass ejections. Um, the, the nuclear, uh, it's, it's going to be basically an air burst over a city, so it's a very small area that's affected. It's the CME that people need to be paranoid about. Um, any modern vehicle uh, that has a, a lot of computer chips in it and stuff like that are just basically going to be fried. Um, exactly, yes. Yeah. Now, when you mention that it's only going to be sort of local areas yeah. uh, affected because the burst would be over cities. Yeah, that's um, right. yeah you're, only, you're only talking about maybe five, ten square kilometers that would be affected. Um, well, here's because, the thing. Uh, the actual land area that might be affected by an EMP uh, may be relatively small. But when you look at the interconnectedness of, of power grid systems, uh, for example, you know, a transmission or a, trans, uh, a, trans, a generating system goes out in, in Quebec and it affects, it can affect people down in, you know, New York State. So that, oh, that interconnectedness of the power grid system that would have me concerned. Yeah, but a, but a, a Carrington event happening in today's day and age would be, uh, it would knock us back into the Stone Age. Um, they they say that you know we're six meals away from total chaos. Um, basically, so we're what? We're how far away from total chaos? Six six square meals away from total chaos. Six square yes, yeah, six square meals exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how <laughs> that's how poorly prepared we are. I mean, Mark in Alberta, uh, your your province has a uh, a wonderful reputation that I admire for self reliance. Mm -hmm. uh, have you taken? Um, precautions? Are you a, a bit of a survivalist? Oh, absolutely. I'm a fifth generation Albertan, um, and so all my family was originally farmers. I have uh, a large stockpile, as they say, the, the, the three B's beans, bullets, and band aids. <laughs> I've not heard that. The no. three B's beans, bullets, and band aids. That's right, yeah. 
And uh, uh, do you have a, a how many months supply uh, food and water do you, do you have? Um, well, I, maybe at the house here uh, in the city, maybe about a month. Um, but I wouldn't let it go that long. We would head to the family ranch um, up near the mountains. Uh, much more sustainable, um, better security. Um, honestly, if, if, if people do research on this type of thing, um, you're, the whole bugging out thing, you know, grab your backpack and go live in the bush isn't going to work. The uh, staying in your house, um, thinking that your neighbors will be your friends for, you know, a year isn't going to work. People will do anything to feed their kids. Uh, people will do anything to stay warm. Um, everything from if you've got a wood-burning fireplace, you know, people are going to see that. Uh, they're going to come looking for heat in your home. You name it. So you're, you're opting for the uh, get-out-of-dodge Oh, absolutely. Scenario. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I live in uh, I live in a, in a, in a fair sized city. You know, maybe a couple hundred thousand people, but uh, um, it's it, it would be absolute chaos. Um, if you look at the at the floods in High River, Alberta, um, it's still absolutely uh, a gong show there. People, if if it wasn't for the Red Cross, bless their hearts, uh, stuff like that, uh, people would be would be dying, and that's just from a flood. Yes, yes. It's you know it's true. They say that oftentimes people are at their best when things are at their worst. But that's over a fairly short period of time, maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of months at best. But what happens if the lights go out for several years? It's and scary. we'll see. It's scary. Mark in Alberta, great to hear from you. Thanks for checking in. Thank you, Richard. Enjoy the rest of your vacation. Will do. All right, back to Ron Patton, publisher of Paranoia Magazine. Ron, while time allows, let's uh, take a quick look at the f- upcoming fall uh, issue of Paranoia. Okay, I just uh, wanted to just briefly mention that we had the uh, Paranoia Con July 20th and 21st here in San Diego, California. And uh, if people want to take a look at uh, some of the speakers, and uh, I believe there's some video footage of that, they can uh, go to paranoiacon.com. We had uh, Adam Go Rightly, Ralph Epperson, Olaf Phillips, Dean Haglin from the X Files there, just to name a few speakers. So uh, yeah, go check that out. But uh, for our upcoming fall 2013 issue, uh, some of the articles that we have featured are going to be the Secret War on Human Consciousness. Is the Dalai Lama a CIA asset? Of course, that's going to be that's interesting. Very controversial. <laughs> Um, and then we do have a, uh, an article dealing with the JFK, JFK assassination called Daily Plaza and the Dream by Mac White, who's a, uh, a comic illustrator and a radio show host um, who, was, uh, who grew up in Texas. And so it's sort of about his uh, take on it when he was a, a youngster. And then we have uh, an article by uh, Marie D. Jones and Larry Flaxman, uh, both of whom I believe have been on your show. And it's called Good Vibrations, The Healing Effects of Resonance. And uh, another um, article is The Big Data Street Fight, Turf Wars in the Shadows. And uh, that has to do sort of about, uh, it deals more with uh, surveillance issues and the uh, Eric Snowden affair. Um, so it's a, a very timely article. And then we have uh, an article dealing with Hollywood mind control, and that's by uh, Jamie Hanshaw. So those are just a, a few articles for the uh, upcoming issue. And, uh, again, if people want to check out the website, they go to www.paranoiamagazine.com. Well, uh, kudos to you, Ron, for um, uh, resurrecting paranoia from its uh, dormancy. Uh, you know, the timing couldn't have been better. I, I, I can't think of uh, a time when we needed a publication like Paranoia Magazine more than we do right now. I mean, you've, you've just sort of come, brought the paper or pr- brought the magazine back online when, when we need it most. Uh, what, what kind of response are you getting from, from people? Um, we're getting really good response, and uh, subscriptions are 
are going up, it seems like, with uh, each issue that we put out. And we are uh, quarterly, so we come out four times a year. But uh, I'm never um, short of having enough articles or writers wanting to uh, submit their uh, pieces to uh, Paranoia. And so, you know, we also try to uh, disseminate the information through multimedia. So not only do we have hard copy, but we're also going to be putting uh, Paranoia online as well for people to check out. And uh, we're going to be also doing uh, a radio show here in the not-too-distant future called, appropriately, Paranoia Radio. And uh, Adam Go Rightly will be the host. How oh, wonderful. Um, hey, so that's great news. Trying to go at different levels. Well, you picked a good man with Adam Go Rightly. Uh, he's a terrific guy and very knowledgeable. Uh, you mentioned uh, in the upcoming issue uh, you're going to touch on the, um, uh, the, the the Snowden affair, and, and uh, since that broke, I mean, you and I have not chatted uh, for several months. Uh, I'd like to get your, your your take on on that situation, just in the couple of minutes that remain. Right. Well, um, I, I remember when it first came out, and for the most part, I I really thought it was more of a diversion or a distraction because. From, you know, what I read and what he was, uh, you know, putting out, you know, I just felt that, well, what's, no, there's nothing new under the sun, really, of uh, what he was exposing. And, uh, you know, Echelon and, and the uh, type of surveillance that have been going on for the past 30 or 40 years, um, again, th- this has been happening for quite a long time, and I think when you start having so much um, press coverage on a subject like this, I think there's really something else that's going on. And uh, so that's pretty much my my take on it. Um, But it also seems like within the NSA and the CIA, there might be some sort of uh, um, confrontation going on in in terms of uh, surveillance. So... I, it's almost like a smoke and mirror game to me. In other words, these alphabet intel groups, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, uh, they're, I guess, behind the scenes in some sort of a turf battle. Uh, and so perhaps the CIA was using Snowden uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool to, to embarrass the, the National Security Agency. Is that the idea? Yeah, I mean, that's what I have concluded <laughs> for the most part. All right, well, we'll look forward to reading about that in the fall issue of Paranoia Magazine. Ron Patton, publisher, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been my pleasure, Richard. Thank you for having me.